Um, I first would like to um, acknowledge um, country and I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship um, of the lands on which we meet. <clears throat> and we pay our respect to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connection to country. And also we would like to acknowledge the valuable contributions to Australian and global society. <clears throat> So please note that this um, presentation is going to be recorded and please leave your video on if you do not um, wish to be recorded. And instead... Um, yeah, and also if you would like to be added to our PEPS mailing list um, and also receive invitations for future seminars, please let us know, and then we will add you to um, the mailing lists. So we're going to talk today about um, the dynamics on state capture. And state capture, where private powers um, influence state decisions, is a phenomenon that impacts governance, impacts public policy, and also is a challenging to our democracy. And we're very privileged to have today um, two distinguished experts um, in the field of climate change and also public policy, who will share today um, the insights on how corporate activities influence public policies. And we have two speakers today, um, Dr. Beck Colvin and Dr. Daniel Nyberg. So first we will hear from um, Beck Colvin, who is a senior lecturer at um, the ANU Crawford School of Public Policy and also a DECRA fellow. And Dr. Colvin um, leads a project um, seeking to understand the influence on um, of unconventional advocates like farmers, business people, and also political conservatives on public opinion on climate change. And Beckhoven also aims to identify ways to establish constructive and community-led dialogue on regional futures in coal-producing areas. Okay, <laughs> now. You ready to make Yes, right. perfect. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to come today. So my plan is to talk a little bit about state capture from the perspective of how I see these sorts of themes play out in communities, especially communities where the types of industries that are often the culprits of state capture have a fairly substantial influence on the social and um, cultural dynamics there. Okay, let's put that in my pocket. Um, so as background to this, I want to mention that all of this stuff happens when we think about state capture and the role of industries and the role of influence, especially on anything related to energy and to climate. It's in the context of the conflict that we've been going through over the last decade plus. And there's some highlights on the screen. <laughs> if you've seen me present before, you know, this is a slide I recycle a little bit. But um, just to say that it's been complicated in terms of the policy and the politics and the social responses. And even though the social dynamics have shifted a little bit, political and policy dynamics have shifted a little bit too, we've still got the legacy of how things have played out in the past. And for those of you who saw Sarah present yesterday talking about the ups and the downs of policy coming and going, I create a point, as Sarah rightly highlighted, where we're at an up, but that doesn't mean we'll keep going toward more better policy in the future. So we can look over time, and this is some data from the Lowy Institute, from the annual Lowy poll, where they ask this question to get people to express which of the three statements on the screen best reflects their views on climate change. So you can take this dark blue line, the one that starts at 68 up on the left as being probably the perspective that we'd say is the closest to aligning with what the world's leading scientists are telling us is about the reality of climate change and the need to act if the world wants to limit future warming. And so public opinion has been high and dipped and regained a little bit. 
But in the same time, climate risk hasn't done that same sort of thing. It's just kept going up. So it tells us that other factors influence public opinion. And I often will emphasise some of the political changes and, of course, the changes to party of government and the prime ministership come with all of the policy debates that we've had. But one of the other ways that we can think about it as well is especially in this bit where it goes, <laughs> there are some other factors at play and they are the major campaigns that the mining sector run, ran. So um, they're described as having run three major campaigns in this period. The first was against the carbon pollution reduction scheme. The next was against the um, resource super profits tax, which got watered down into the minerals resource rent tax. Um, and then repealed, and then the carbon price as well. I want to talk a little bit about what happened with these campaigns with a particular focus on the resource super profits tax. Excuse me, that yeah. story was from the Zoomers that you keep within the field of vision of the webcam. Oh, yeah. sorry, Zoomers. <laughs> Maybe I can turn you this way a little bit. That might be better. Thank you. Thanks, Winifred. Um, so the resource super profits tax was announced with very little consultation with industry. It was announced by the Rudd government shortly after, because <laughs> it was quite controversial. There was a leadership spill um, under Gillard. It was changed to the minerals resource rent tax, which looked similar to the resource super profits tax, but it was weaker. It would have retained less benefit for the public or for the state. Um, Abbott became Prime Minister and then the Minerals Resource Rent Tax was repealed. So you can look at some of the details over here of the difference between them. Um, and I've put a certain threshold and a higher threshold because I don't really know the details, but I, the point is that the Resource Super Profits Tax would have collected more tax off more profits um, of a wider scope of actors and the Minerals Resource Rent Tax reduced all of those dimensions. But there's been some interesting political science work that's looked at the impact of these campaigns. And so I just want to take some quotes from a few papers that um, give some nice insights. So this one in particular has a quote from Tony Abbott saying that he called on the mining industry to become political activists for a couple of years because they were so successful at undermining this policy that his government was opposed to. Was also the chief executive of the Minerals Council of Australia noting that there's been a shift in the manner of public policy development and implementation. The new paradigm is one of public contest through the popular media, more so than rational considered development and implementation. So that was a dig at the fact that they felt they weren't suitably consulted before the announcement of the resource super profits tax. It also speaks to the fact that the reaction that the industry took toward their policies was to go into the public sphere and start really engaging in quite intense um, public debate. So the Minerals Council of Australia was at the vanguard of industry mobilisation. It had dramatically failed to influence government deliberations through consultation. In less than a day, it decided to mount a major public campaign directed to the general public. And so a quote from someone from the industry says that the government may not care what you think, but they do care what the population thinks. So therefore, a very public campaign, you were really influencing the government through the prism of the general population. So this is where the industry went out to try to get to the hearts and the minds of everyday Australians to create at least the sense that the weight of public opinion was on their side and opposed to the policies. Um, they took a couple of approaches to the campaign. So the first was to produce reports and really official looking data and academic looking papers. And then the second part is this bit speaking to the wider community at large. So they put together a major campaign strategy in a couple of days. Um, they used focus groups. Uh, they marshaled an immense amount of resources to get this together and implemented it and ran it. I think I'm going to talk a bit about their resources. So the main companies that were involved in this, um, Strata, BHP and Rio Tinto, together they're worth more than the size of Australia's federal budget and about one third the size of the entire Australian economy. So this was the scale of the resources that were available to put together this campaign in a very short amount of time. What they found during their focus groups in this rapid turnaround to develop their campaign 
was that the Australian public had this view that the mining sector helped get Australia through the global financial crisis. And so that led to this narrative becoming available that if something's good for mining, sorry, I keep forgetting about the people in mine, if something's good for mining, it's good for Australia, and if something's bad for mining, it's bad for Australia. And we can kind of see the imprint of this still. <laughs> so this is... Um, some data that Kelly Fielding and Frank Yotso and I have in a paper that's under review at the moment. But the question is, do the economic benefits of coal mining outweigh any negative impacts it has? And you can see how spread that is. Like that's a pretty even distribution around the midpoint there. And this is like aggregated at the national level. This is a quota sample of the population. And you would see a lot of variation depending on where you're going. Like speak to people in the inner city suburbs and I think you'd see a skew toward disagreements, trying to work out which way was anti-coal, which way was pro-coal. Go to the coal communities and you might see more of a skew toward agreement with it. But one of the other things that the industry did so well was they labelled this thing the mining tax and calling it the mining tax creates um, a sense of, uh, it implies who it's relevant to and also um, brings in lots of different interests. So even if you just do like a news search for what it was called, resource super profits tax, get a thousand results, search for mining tax and you get eight times that amount. One of the reasons that this is important is that calling it the mining tax is a way of suggesting this is a tax on miners, on mining. So resource super profits tax might make you think of fat cats, <laughs> which is certainly what the intent was meant to be behind this um, policy approach. So the idea of super profits was profits above a certain level is what you do the tax on. Um, it also got called the super tax on profits, whereas it's the tax on super profits. Mm -hmm. But calling it the mining tax really speaks to people who work in the mining sector, who are miners, who feel like it's something that's targeting them. So here's another quote from some of this um, pulse I work. The government tried to really demonise the industry and characterise it as being big, rich, fat miners who rape the land and send all the profits overseas. In turn, the advertising campaign aimed to really debunk that image, evolving its story to you hurt mining, you hurt Australia. Um, and they really made it quite personal as well. So that speaks to some of the power of the industry and the ways in which they will actively engage in crafting social meaning and engaging in society and engaging in culture in order to reaffirm their place. But other work, and this is a paper that I really, really love from 2018, has looked at how do people who live in multi-generational mining towns feel when they see challenges against the coal sector? I think this is really important thinking about state capture because so much of um, the idea of fragmenting or eroding state capture is about starting to expose what the industries are doing. But if you're looking at how you can expose these industries, that can be experienced in ways in the communities that are interwoven with the industries in ways that are quite different from how they're intended to be. So this paper um, was looking at how is it that people in this multi-generational coal mining community experience environmental campaigning and they found that it felt quite personal, like it was an attack on the right to exist, on the dignity of people who are miners, even when the intention there may have been about the mining sector and highlighting some of the issues with the mining sector, which certainly has um, negative consequences locally as well, like people in these mining communities have a really complex relationship with the mines, that the approach of the campaigning had that very much, if you're a miner, you have no value you have no future, we don't like you, you're a terrible person. I shouldn't laugh as I say that, but that's um, the way it was felt. And this came through as well. Um, I know I've talked about this to some of you before, but looking at the campaign in 2019 ahead of the federal election, which was run by the Stop Adani um, campaign or the group of organisations under the Stop Adani banner, and looking at the way the media represented this protest movement, really set it up as being an us versus them type battle. Um, it created the media narratives, created clear markers of belonging that said what will make you be with these people versus be with these people. And some of the main lines of division were about being a um, person from the regions versus from the cities, being a hard worker versus a dole bludger or an elite 
and being from Queensland, <laughs> sorry everyone, versus everywhere else. And one of the things that that does is it doesn't just create these heuristics for making sense of how people would feel about this particular issue, the development of the Carmichael coal mine in Queensland, but it comes a point of reference for making sense of future issues that emerge that have similar patterns. So once you get those us and them dynamics, as I know the social identity specialists in the room know, like they stick around and they become a point of reference in the future as well. One of the other things that played out was where the protest movement was using the Adani mine as kind of like a symbol of the power of coal and the need for climate action. The alternative symbolism that developed in the regional communities was much more about regional self-determinism. So don't let those folks from the cities come and tell us that we don't matter, that we don't have a future. It also meant that these types of social cleavages that end up being along the lines of the greenies versus the hard workers, city versus country, they obscure other social cleavages that are probably much more salient to questions of how you can challenge state capture, like um, economic and class divides, for instance, where there could be alternative perspectives where you can see much more ability to bring people together across that um, Go Galilee Basin, Stop Adani type line. So there's complications with the way that we draw attention to our differences. And because they're urban regional divide seemed to be such a clear narrative in this. I just want to talk a little bit about this idea of the greenie. And this has been a topic that's bubbled up in a few different projects that I've been doing. It isn't something I've set out to understand, but I think it's worth exploring. And I have this great idea for a paper where the title is going to be in quotations. I'm not a greenie, but dot, 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 because mm -hmm. that's a type of sentiment that people have been telling me, speaking with farmers, speaking with people in the Hunter Valley. They're saying, you know, I actually care about air pollution, but I'm not one of the greenies. And I can't talk about this because <clears throat> I'll be branded a greenie if I do. But unfortunately, Hillary Whitehouse already published a paper with that title. <laughs> so there's been two papers published on this idea of the cultural discourse of the greenie in Australia, and I've got my title, so disappointed. But the work that's been done um, has is quite interesting, and speaking about it as a cultural discourse, it's very much present in the regions, not so much in the cities. And this is certainly my observation through my research, my personal life as well. And one of your colleagues here at UQ, Dr. Brad Witt, who was my lead PhD supervisor, over a decade ago did some research on the urban regional divide. And he had quite an interesting study where he went to people in the regions and said, what do you reckon folks in the city think about how you look after the environment? And they said, people in the city look down on us. They think we're vandals, that we don't do the right thing. He went, okay, thank you. Went to the cities and ran some focus groups and said, what do you folks in the city think about people in the country and how they look after the environment? They said, they're cool. <laughs> so there's this perception divide as well. And Brad really speaks to the rural press as being um, somewhere that is kind of where these narratives are fostered and where they come from. But the idea of the greenie, speaks to a whole lot of other kind of bundled aspects of social change, like radicals that want to overthrow capitalism, can you imagine? Mm -hmm. um, and a whole lot of additional uh, characterizations that put them at odds with the norms that are often held up in many regional communities as being what it means to be an upstanding person. So if you call someone a greenie, you're not just saying they care about the environment, you're saying they're reckless, they reject our society, they reject our values, they're an outsider, they're not like us. And then some of the work that I've done, this was um, interviews with farmers in New South Wales who are members of or are, are affiliated with the um, organisation Farmers for Climate Action. Some of the time, like I wasn't asking about the greenie stuff, it would just come up. You don't want to be labelled a radical greenie or something. You know, I'm comfortable with it. I don't care. But you don't want your kids to get a hard time. You know, your mum and your dad are wackos or greenies or whatever it is. They could be bullying in the playground. And it goes on. And so other work as well, I can't remember if I've got some quotes from it. Might come to it later. But work in the Hunter Valley was people saying, if I talk about the fact that there might be jobs in renewables, I get branded a raving commie. I think I do have that quote coming up. So these sorts of things, this 
idea of the greenie stops people from talking openly about things that matter to them because that becomes a process of being othered within their community where being a greenie, which has anything to do with social change or environmental issues, um, comes at a bit of a social cost. And so I just want to highlight, this is again work with um, Kelly Fielding and Frank Yotso, a paper that's under review. We were looking to see whether we could find a signal of an urban regional divide on climate opinion in Australia, and we expected we would. So we put together seven items that were drawn from existing survey instruments or modified from them <clears throat> because we thought we'd find an urban regional divide. We thought we should ask questions on other contentious issues as well to see if there is a divide, is it just on climate or is it on other stuff too? So we found no statistically identifiable difference between people in the cities and the regions in terms of their opinion on climate change. And across all the social issues, we didn't find a difference except for one. And the one issue was are city people and country people more different than they are similar? <laughs> and on this, people from the regions were about twice as likely to agree with that statement than people from the cities. But you can see, like overall, this is just the um, sampled together. There is still um, a bit of a tendency for people to think there is this fundamental difference. So this goes back to that idea of um, Brad Witt's work talking about there being a bit of a myth of difference between um, city people and country people that maybe obscures the fact that there's a bit more in common than we might think. But just to talk briefly now, and I've presented on this work a bit to UQ before, so I'll keep it relatively brief. I want to go to the Upper Hunter Valley. So Newcastle, you'd know this place well. Just inland from Newcastle is this incredible place that has been so transformed by mining. This is the um, Google Earth view, and all of these blobs are open-cut coal mines. And if you've been on the edge of an open-cut coal mine, it's one of those things that really messes with your perceptions. It's just this expansive moonscape. And so people who live around here, there's towns like um, Bolga was um, a town where a whole lot of people got bought out by the mine. The people who are left are feeling like they're the remaining holdouts, but the community's fallen apart. Like there's just incredible transformation of the Upper Hunter as a result of the mines. And the expansion really happened from around a decade ago. But you can see the way in which so going back to the state capture thing, you can see the way in which the industry influence is really woven through life in the Upper Hunter. This is just a cafe that um, a colleague and I happened across, the Coal Rock Cafe. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of pride there in being a coal mining town. And the quote that you can see on the screen was from a really interesting fellow who um, worked in real estate, so he didn't have a specific interest in mining or in anything necessarily opposed to mining. But he has this view that people who are from the outside who say, let's get rid of coal, they don't understand what that means. And that came through quite a lot in speaking with people in the region who have a fairly nuanced view of the way in which coal industry is interconnected in their local economies and filters through um not just the direct jobs that you get in the industry, which is what the Australia Institute often puts in their reports, they count direct employment by the mining sector, but actually all of the value chains that are in those local communities that are dependent on the mines and the power stations. But one of the things that I want to highlight here um, is that last sentence. I think most people agree that we have to transition, but you can't just leave it in the ground overnight. <laughs> and so speaking to people in the sector, they'll often be, or in the communities, there'll often be this recognition that something needs to be done, but they feel that everyone else is super radical, super extreme, and there's not that ability to have um, practical planning. And in my opinion, that's not an accident, that the uh, industry will see those um, narratives do letterbox drops with flyers that talk about how the Greens want to shut down every coal mine yesterday, for instance. And so just to go back to the us and them stuff and how that affects the way people can engage, these are some quotes that were pretty interesting. I think I read this one out to you before about being a raving commie if you talk about jobs and renewables. But another one, it's so weird because all the communities are pulling together here again. This was in response to the bushfires until you bring climate change or the Greens into it. And then the polarisation, straight back again. <laughs> so people in the communities can come together, but once you refer to these um, points of division, they'll split apart. 
And so that becomes really challenging for the way in which you have conversations about um, what is the right role for the industry or how might the conduct of the industry be shifted over time. I just want to highlight here, this is a paper by a colleague of mine and Sarah's, Kate Donnelly, who's working for the Investor Group on Climate Change. But Kate did this research last year in Queensland up in Blackwater, which was her hometown. And she was talking to people. This is a metallurgical coal mining area. So met coal is used for steel production. It's not going to be subject to the forces of decarbonisation of the electricity system that will see thermal coal going out sooner. And one of the points that Kate <clears throat> emphasised was that in Blackwater, there wasn't this massive polarisation around the future, but a big part of the reason why is that there hadn't been outside advocates going in and picking at scabs and stirring the pot. But she was seeing in the um, discourses and the narratives from people she was speaking to that there's so much potential for that, like this latent conflict that could emerge quite easily. Um and so this is something that I've been thinking about a little bit recently. Some of you might have heard that Australia's announced that we're going to be establishing a net zero authority. And the way this is set up is that there was a net zero economy task force in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, which has um, become the net zero economy agency, which is now tasked over the next 12 months with establishing the authority, which will be legislated. And that will probably come into place around July next year. And the authority is meant to be helping workers and communities navigate the net zero transition to drive investment in net zero compatible industries in the regions and also to coordinate across government because there's so much institutional complexity with who's got jurisdiction and the intersection of planning and environmental protection type laws in these spaces. And so one of the things that in my mind is really important for the Net Zero Authority is to be cognizant of these cultural and social um, points of division and legacy in the past, because as they intervene, they need to be showing respect for people in the coal communities. They'll learn a lot more about the ways in which to intervene in regional economies if they're actually responding to what people know about the, their own place rather than making decisions from Canberra, from afar and pulling strings. But also, I do think there's a genuine opportunity for something like the Net Zero Authority to be part of the repair for these social divisions. And that's because in the research with people in the Upper Hunter, a lot of people have been calling for certainty, even folks from the coal industry, people who'll say, you know, we know coal's not going to be around forever, but we reckon we've got it till the end of the century, which is different time scale from people who say we think it's going to be gone in the next decade. But they're recognising that there needs to be some sort of planning and they're scared about the fact that they don't know what's going to happen and they're looking at things like the closure of um, the car manufacturing industry or the ANSET factory and seeing the ways in which that's just had these multi-generational ongoing impacts in regional communities. So the authority has a potential to act as a point of certainty, but whether it engages meaningfully with people in the communities or whether it becomes a Canberra-based agency that meddles in the communities will be, in my opinion, one of the most critical aspects of this new entity as to whether it can help with disentangling some of these aspects of state capture and state influence and especially countering some of the unconstructive narratives that come from the industry. Having said that, there's been um, a bit of a call from industry for some certainty around this as well. And so I just want to finish up um, by talking a little bit about our discovery project. Um, one of the things that seems to be making a difference in regional communities is having people who aren't your traditional greenie or your environmentalist talking to them about these sorts of ideas. And so Winifred and Kelly and Sarah and I are really interested in groups like these on the screen that are coming at climate change and energy change from this alternative identity position. So the Blueprint Institute is um, unofficially but is aligned with the Liberal Party. <laughs> and Farmers for Climate Action based in the ag sector, Investor Group on Climate Change works in the business space. And the Hunter Jobs Alliance is um, an interesting um, bringing together of the trade union movement and the environmental movement that are really foregrounding the benefits to communities of transition, calling for transition planning. Um, so these sorts of groups have the potential also be part of repairing these differences because when we've got these 
super loaded narratives about greenies and greenies being outsiders that are coming in to shut down our communities because they don't like us and they think we have no value. That doesn't um, help us disentangle some of their complex relationships between the state and the industry. So I'll finish there. That's my um, social regional communities take on state capture and what I see as being some of the challenges and the opportunities for starting to dig into these relationships. Thank you, Seth. Um, I'm Winifred Lewis, for those that don't know me, and I'm co-chairing with Chris today. Our next speaker um, is Daniel Nyberg. And for those that haven't been to a PEP seminar before, I'll just say our format is that both speakers will speak and then they'll briefly speak to each other's presentation. Hope you guys remember that, um, Beck and Daniel, <laughs> just for a couple of minutes talking about the disciplinary differences in the approach before we open it up to the wider audience for questions. And we do look forward to your questions, including the Zoomers. You can just put them in the chat and we can look back to them um, or you can wait and raise it later. And um, so um, I lock Beck's work because she problematizes the simple dichotomy between the good activists and the evil corporations that are fighting for the passive public in the middle and raises the agency of regional communities and the industries that they house and the transition they want to make as a, a voice that needs to be heard. Um, but I also love Daniel's work, um, which is very different and talks about what the corporations are not doing in public, but as much in private and the way that they have that influence on state capture. So um, Professor Daniel Nyberg is at the School of Business here um, now and at the University of Queensland, and we're very fortunate to have him. And he originally came from Newcastle. I think it's a sort of Hunter Valley theme here. Perhaps no coincidence that our experts on state capture are based in that area. Um, Daniel, welcome. Thank you. And, and thank you back for, for, for that presentation. I thought it was amazing. And there is a bit of overlap and, and it's obviously not surprising since we're both interested in, in climate change and we both uh, asked to talk about um, state capture. So I, I'm going to try to not uh, just use example for the fossil fuel industry, but it's, it's, so it's such an easy uh, target, if you like, if you want to be a bit um, uh, binary. Um, so before I start, you might want to clarify a little bit what I mean with state capture here. So on one hand, we can think about state as a geographical area, and on the other hand, we can think of it as a political entity. Uh, when I talk about state capture here, I basically talk about the capture of democracy. And democracy, I guess, uh, is, is empty in that sense that we, as people, have to come up with what, what this form of government is. But it also means, I guess, that um, democracy is one of those way to lead people that also undermine itself. We can imagine societies voting for less democracies, which is happening in, in Europe and other places at the moment, where we vote in less democracy. Uh, so what I'm talking about is really de-democratization rather than state capture as a smaller political phenomenon. And uh, so in doing that, as, as these are three, I guess, spheres where you can think about are important for democracy. So you have the political sphere, which is normally what we talk about in states. So there's easily state captures, and I have a few examples up here on how this how the, this political sphere is captured by campaign contribution, lobbying, and so on. I will go into further details about this. But we also have the public sphere, and Beck was talking a bit about that in terms of how community uh, have the are influenced in their communication, what they think are uh, good policies, the deliberation in, in, in communities. And we've seen public relations firms and uh, advertorials in the in local newspapers. Uh, we know that these local newspapers are also normally owned by certain corporations and then favor certain types of argument that benefit their profit line, but also their philosophical position, if, if, the, if I may say that. Uh, but finally, we also have the private sphere. And uh, this is where we as citizens perhaps come up with our political preferences or our decisions through away from both the public and the political sphere to decide what we think. And these three spheres, I think, capture a lot of what we mean by democracy and democratic processes in terms of have an influence in decision making. We are represented. Uh, we also would like to be part of deliberation and decide together what we should uh, have as a political decision, but also 
our right as individuals and our liberty as individuals to make up our mind. So it caps, sort of captured the sort of equality and liberty paradox, if, if you want, through these three spheres. So when I'm talking about political corruption then, it is this idea that corruption is a derivative concept that something is corrupted. And when I talk about political corruption, I would basically mean that democracy as an idea is corrupted. So I'm not talking about, uh, you know, the, someone gets money for something else or uh, pro quid quo or something like that. It's rather corruption of our democratic processes. And then here I outline basically where how it happens in the three different spheres. And then I'm going to use quite a few examples. And you can recognize some of them from Beck's uh, uh, presentations. I will skip, uh, be a bit quicker with those. But you can see how in the political sphere we see campaign contribution, making sure that uh, citizens are excluded or, or their voices are suppressed in the process, where politicians have to spend much more time pampering for lobbyists and so on. And then in the in the public sphere, you see the advocates advertise public relations firms and so on. That again means that their citizens have limited point, position to deliberate in this. Again, not getting their voices heard. They're sort of excluded from the public deliberation. And then uh, finally, uh, the private sphere, where the, the suppression is rather the interest. So through polit uh, political education, I will give, give a few examples of universities here, not this university, but other universities, uh, for how we as citizens get our education through corporations. So the point I'm suggesting here is that Political corruption, I'm going through to one of these for each, and then I'm going to go to the examples to, to make, make it more colorful, but perhaps more fun. So the point here as, for example, you can take lobbying. So lobbying here, corporate political, political activities that try to influence pub, public policy. In this case, in the, in the political sphere, you have a lobbyist meeting a, 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 a politician in that meeting. Uh, and taking up that time, there's an exclusion of citizen representation because the, the corporations or the lobbyists are not necessarily representing the people. This influence decision making, we know that it does. We know that lobbying firms are successful. We know that campaign contributions skew politicians' decision making. But it also means the corporate empowerment and a dependence of politicians on corporations. So, for example, uh, U.S. Uh, politicians spend 30 to 70 percent of their time looking for money. So as politicians, they become dependent on corporations to succeed. And that, again, just legitimizes further corporate political activities. So we see a, a sort of a circle of, of doom, if you want to, uh, the, where corporations become more and more empowered, a politician more and more dependent on corporations to succeed. Uh, and we also see that when they then leave uh, Parliament, they go, most of them go straight into uh, jobs. The last three defense ministers are now in, 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 in weapon and, 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 um, and, and um, uh, lobbying for defense. So they go from Parliament. And, and the last one, Christopher Pine, he even made up that deal when he was in cabinet. So, they, so there are also these dependence show where, you know, how, how they then move on to, to, to the next step. And I just show a couple of books here. I thought that you know, people have done. Uh, Linda Edwards has done quite a lot on lobbying. And we know Gary Pierce, uh, the liberal insider who spilled the beans in uh, 2012, I think his book came out or something like that. So he's, he's a former liberal staffer and lobbyist who then uh, woken up to climate change and done a great job in, in giving the inside detail how climate, how John Howard's climate policies was just driven by coal lobbying. So that's sort of the political sphere. Now you can see how it happens and, and why it happens. The next one is then the public sphere and a similar model here, but instead what is excluded is then uh, citizen voices and we have uh, influence here in, in, um, in deliberation. So this is more uh, uh, from, from a public sphere position. You can see how uh, corporate political activities uh, and we saw the news today. I don't know if you picked it up that uh, there was a public inquiry on vaping. It was in, in the news today. So over 25% 
of the submissions from uh, people was uh, direct taken from uh, uh, the tobacco industries themselves. So this is astroturfing, just skewing uh, public inquiries. We look, all these people said e-cigarettes is helping them breathe mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and so on. So, so you can see how even in, in, in public deliberation, the corporations then ca can skew these things through what, what is often called astroturfing. So in this case, it was the uh, tobacco industry and vaping industry, uh, which obviously overlap, who influenced the, the possibility to have a public inquiry about the risk of vaping by having skewing the submissions to the, to the um, uh, inquiry. We also saw uh, classic is um, Exxon Mobiles in the advertorials through the 80s and 90s, uh, sort of in New York Times and other ma in other newspapers, sort of portraying it as an article saying climate change is not really happening, uh, and you know or there might even be warming. And uh, New York Times obviously was happy with this because that also uh, led to a lot of advertisement. And we can see also that the, the media outlets is here problematic in the corporate driven media outlet that we see, for example, around 50% or over 50% of all news articles in financial media are press releases. So Wall Street Journal, more than half of their articles are just retakes of press releases. Uh, so again, you can see how that incorporate uh, po corporate power, and and we we don't have a public deliberation as such because the media is so heavily influenced by corporations. And we also seen a shift over the last couple of decades where media uh, profit today doesn't come from news. They're not selling news; they're selling advertisements. So and obviously, who's advertising? Not so much private citizen trying to deliver their positions, mm -hmm. rather. Corporations and here I, 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 I uh, uh, backstored my two examples: uh, uh, the both the the uh, the mining tax and then the super profit tax. Oh, sorry, the super profit tax, but also the carbon tax. Um, and here, uh, and Beck went into detail here, so I, I won't won't speak to it. But what she didn't mention was, uh, and it's not that she doesn't know it, it's just, you know, she's mentioned a lot of things. Uh, and what she didn't mention, but not an admission of fault, just that she didn't mention it. Sorry, I'm just taking a hole here. I'm just going to continue. Um, so it, I think um, the mining industry in, it paid, for, paid around $22 million for, for the advertisement across TV, radio, and newspapers. And Financial Review calculated a save around hundred billion dollars over a decade. I mean, that's return on investment to shape public opinion. It's pretty cool. And it's, it's not the fact that they actually necessarily changed public opinion. It was enough to convince the politician, in this case, Kevin Rudd, who's already on the downhill because he wasn't seen as nice by most journalists by then. Uh, and it was quite easy to get ri rid of him in that sense but through this, through this uh, continuous advertisement. And we we uh, we got we got actually hold of all the advertising materials because we thought this is super interesting. But as soon as the um, as soon as the the campaign was over, they just obviously killed the pages and everything. Um, so so we was like just too late. And then and then we had a a, a research a postdoc contacting the mining industry uh, for oh, do you have can we get access to this uh, material? And she hit the goal because she obviously got to us. A, I assume a lower level staff who gave her the password to the to their page. So we just don't downloaded all their materials. I have that sitting on a computer, I've written a little bit about it. But yes, we just quickly downloaded all their materials to our computer and we, we used it ever since. Um so yes, but the, the point here obviously how how easy it was for for the mining industry to convey. Uh, that in this public sphere, everyone agrees this is a bad tax. The first one was a business tax, and the second one was a money tax. Um, yes, and then the final uh, sphere is the private sphere. And I guess here it becomes a bit more complicated because the first two spheres is quite easy to imagine the lack of the de deliberation and the lack of representation. So influence of preference is, is, is obviously harder to sort of prove or show uh, because uh, how do we know, right? And it's much hard, easier to show through through 
connections and, and links, both the influence in the political sphere and the public sphere. But in, in the private sphere, it becomes much, much harder to, to, to unpack that. But it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. We just don't know really. And I think that's it's something that I'm not qualified for, but it, it hopefully it's possible to unpack this a bit. So we know, for example, that uh, companies in the US clearly articulate their voting preferences to the or to the to members of staff. In Sweden, a few years back, we have a big hamburger chain like McDonald's, but a little bit fancier, and it's called Max. It has around hundred stores in in Sweden, so it's a big chain for Sweden, which is a small country. And they they a couple, couple of extras sent out a letter to all their employees. It, it would be a catastrophe if you vote, vote in the opposition. An opposition obviously is is left or social democratic. So they they sent out this letter to to all the employees. So we see these kind of um, uh, uh, political maneuvers in in um, in the private sphere. And similarly, in education, we know, for example, that energy companies, both in Australia and the US, provide education material to primary schools. So, oh, you you're having a week on energy discussions. Here's a booklet for your students and. Uh, we have a, Millie, uh, our, our youngest kid. So we live in we, we live in Newcastle, or they still live there. And um, me researching climate change, and she's you know she's been slowly indoctrinated to believe this is important. And then and obviously one day she went to school and voiced this. Uh, and in in cold country, I mean, this is, she's pretty brave or stupid, um, but so she voiced his opinion in school and she came back home and we had sat sitting down at dinner and she was like, you can see her you're waiting to say something. and said, Daniel, if it weren't for cold, we wouldn't have any cars, any houses, any, any so on and so on and so on and so on. And so, on. so obviously going back to school with his opinions and she got immediately shut down by, by her peers who get their energy education from home, but also from school materials where coal industry has provided or energy industry provided this. So you, you can see how the private spheres, and I'm not suggesting that we have a possibility for complete independent reasoning and, and independent pr pr provider preferences. Obviously, we are political creatures and get all our preferences from somewhere, but I'm just suggesting here that corporations are uh, swaying our preferences through uh, our employment, but also an example that a lot of our dependence on corporations for healthcare uh, in many countries now, uh, with private healthcare, uh, education, and so on, is it, it, uh, also uh, more and more privately uh, um, pro provided. And uh, you might hear the reason I mentioned Sweden is because I'm from Sweden. That's my silly accent. If you didn't already know it, so and in Sweden now is the only country in the world I think where we have private primary education. So we have for-profit corporation. Often with a with with a, with a with a headquarters in the Cayman Island providing primary education. So obviously that education not going to provide alternative ways of organizing our exchanges of of, of services and goods. And we see a little bit of this here. So this is uh, the the funding of fossil fuel for University of California. And I saw in the news yesterday that Sydney University has a new center of excellence. It's a center of excellence for gambling research. That's amazing. And the gambling industry provided $600,000. And we know that when industry provide this kind of money, it skew the research. We have seen Coca-Cola done it. We see the big sodas done it. We see gambling done it before. We've seen tobacco done it. So again, and then we have, you know, a, a university like Sydney University here, uh, getting this money that would also influence how they teach, and how we, how we as private citizens get our education. I know, I know I'm painting a pretty dark picture here. Uh, so, but I, I do think there are some there, and I, obviously I've been staying at a sort of a, a broad, broader uh, level here. Um, but I do think there is a problem here with, I guess, a political capture uh, that we've we seen. And this has been connected to, I guess, to a movement of neoliberalism, how politicians favor corporate solutions. Uh, so if there's a pro if there's a problem, the solution is normally to privatize it. Uh, and we've seen that in Australia with, you know, with, 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 with energy, uh, poles and wires and so on. But we've seen that in, in most countries come to all public goods. Uh, if there's a problem with these public goods, we'd need to privatize it. And I, I do think that 
often the blame is on, on, on the failure of government, uh, but the failure of government has become a failure of government due to political pressure. So lobbying has creating, pol uh, political uh, voices are creating an, a, a, an assumed failure of governments. So I don't think we should see this as cooperation helping or, or co-governance a failure of government, the failure of government is created for the benefit of uh, corporate capitalism. So we, we see that, uh, but also, and, and, and talking about greenness, we also see in that any, any, any movement against this corporatization uh, is then uh, quite violently shut down. And we see in Australia, most states now have uh, more increase their protest laws to, to be more severe. So you end up in jail for protesting. And this was not driven by politicians. This was driven by the fossil fuel industry. And we see similar the banks in the UK around Occupy movement. So privatizing public spaces so you could not allow to protest on them. So they sort of a, 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 a political capture, uh, one could say. And uh, we also see a sort of a re of of the public sphere where we have small small amount of discussions, and I, I think this is part of the problem around polarization too, is that you have a corporate-owned small media, two couple of big players, not different from our supermarkets, I guess, here in Australia, where uh, they, there is no alternative media companies that have any big. I mean, of course, we have Guardian and the co conversation and so on, but compare their reach, we, we, we don't have much non-corporate uh, media or public sphere to engage in deliberation. Um, but also we see uh, further colonization here, I guess, through astroturfing, how corporations fund protesters to make sure that the, the, the government's uh, policies are, uh, are protested against and so on. So we also see, and, and, and uh, people often point out all the good movements corporations are doing in terms of big corporations like Amazon, Facebook, and all these supporting, for example, uh, Black Lives Matter movement uh, and other, what well, we can see progressive movements. But I still think this is problematic because they're not necessarily representing people when they're doing it. So sure, you can see it as a great thing that, that uh, um, Google or Amazon or Facebook saying Black Lives Matter, but they're not representing the people. They're representing them. Not different from how the mining industry representing the people. Because if you ask them for inclusive democracy, say, well, yeah, that's great. Let's support unionization of the workplace then or more democratic uh, processes in, in society. They all go, no. No. So Starbuck can be really progressive in terms of our coffee beans come from nice farmers or nice farms, but we're going to bust any union in a, for, that is providing any form of democratic say in our company. So there's two problems with this, uh, what conservatives call woke capitalism, I guess. Uh, in that sense, one, they don't represent the people, and two, they're not really for inclusive and equal deliberation. So what can be done? Oh, I, I don't really know, obviously. <laughs> I have no solutions. Um, but we can discuss them, perhaps. Uh, maybe this is uh, things to be done, like in future research. How can we solve this? Because I don't know. Uh, so uh, in the political spheres, I do think we're seeing some experimentations with uh, citizen panels and assemblies. Uh, we see alternative ways of taking decisions. So what I'm arguing for here is more direct or radical forms of democracy. Uh, and why did it fail in France? Um, the citizen assembly on climate change came up with amazing solutions. And I mean, if you look at the solutions, they come up with they're radical, they seem to be working, they're realistic, they're awesome. Macron just didn't act on any of them, but they are really good. Uh, so, you know, maybe there is possibilities to push these things. Uh, alternative platforms, uh, obviously we need to find other ways for a working public sphere where we're not uh, just doing that on, on newspapers that are owned by um, and we, by corporate capitalism that obviously is going to favor that as the solution and driven by advertisement. But so we need alternate forms, forums. And what perhaps what is the role of universities for this? 
Uh, how can universities be uh, uh, more engaged in, in as a public forum? And are we are we are we as universities too scared of that? Especially if we get six hundred thousand dollars from the gambling industry, um, and the private sphere. Um, how can we democratically organize ourselves that is not so dependent on particular interests? Uh, what are the, how can we provide our human needs without necessarily relying on all these exchanges driven by uh, corporate capitalism? So those would be some things to think about. Uh, while they sound, sound utopian, perhaps, I do think uh, the reason they sound utopian is that uh, I think Jameson said that it's sort of easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism, because uh, when we are called something, it, it, you know, the, any radical ideas or, or p opposition to, to the current common sense is often seen as naive, unrealistic, or even dangerous. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So fantastic. I know that we could talk with each of us for half an hour on that, but I'm going to call you up, Beck, um, for a few moments where you reflect on what you heard from Daniel, and then Daniel will ask you to do the same. And I am going to ask both of you to try and keep, I'm sure you could speak for half an hour, but to, <laughs> thank to you. Three, three to five minutes, three kind of five. thing. Just okay. hit some key points, please. Okay, thank you. Thank I know that I saw a fox somewhere, 1129. So thank you, Daniel. That was such an entertaining and enlightening talk. Are those doom cycles your work that you were showing us? Yes. Yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah. Okay, I have to follow up on that. So one of the, like, there's so much to go into, but with a couple of minutes, I think the thing that I want to speak to is one of the points that you concluded on about the difficulty in bringing these doom cycles to the understanding and awareness of other people. And it is that challenge where if the system is invisible, how do you point to it and help other people to start seeing it? Uh, there's a book that I read recently. I can't remember what it's called, but the book included a quote from someone. I can't remember what they were doing or who they were, but the quote was really good. <laughs> and this person was talking about the idea of suitcase concepts. And what he was saying is a suitcase concept is a big thing where there's so much packed into it that everybody has their own version of what's in the suitcase. And climate change, I would say, is one of those terms. Capitalism is one of those terms. And in my view, a lot of the challenges with how to open up these sorts of conversations is that we hit people with the suitcase first and then we expect them to go with us on a journey. Whereas so much about engaging people on complex issues and especially on these sorts of challenges, like I often think learning about capitalism is kind of learning about colonialism where you have to unlearn so much to see it for what it is. You can't hit people with the big scary term that has been built up as a monster and then expect people to start unpacking it with you. And so I think a big part of the challenge here is um, an education question and thinking about how is it where you meet people where they are and find what matters to them and work with them from there. I know um, with my family member who I talk about too often in forums like these, uh, He's someone that the suitcase words would make him shut down. But if you start to talk to him about the unfairness of how much money the billionaires have and what they wasted on, that becomes an opening that we can move into. But it's so critical to not use those suitcase terms. Um, there was some other point that I was going to make. A lot. That's right. There was a um, great writer. I think you'd love her work, Winifred. Um, Jane McAlevey. You might know her yeah. already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It doesn't surprise me. Yeah. So McAlevey is a um, scholar from the US who's been a union organiser for a long time. She's got this beautiful book called No Shortcuts where she talks about the difference between advocacy, mobilising and organising and really makes the point that organising is the way to go to build a broad basis of power to start to make, not that she's talking necessarily in these terms, but I think towards similar ends. So organising is about meeting people where they are, working across difference, accepting people when they might have different views to you across the full spectrum of politicised hot-button issues. Um, and investing the time and what it takes to help people come to their own understanding. And more and more thinking about climate change, energy transition, the impacts on inequality, regional economies. It's that question of how do we move to a model of organising that's based around relationships that, in my view, is really key to these sorts of things. Um, so if it's I can make a binary that doesn't make any sense, don't do the suitcase words, but try to do the 
organizing approach. And I think that's where we start to get the in to do that complex educational puzzle mm-hmm. that you were finishing on. So those were some of the many, but not all of the thoughts that um, went through my head when I was listening to your brilliant talk, Daniel. Thanks. Well, thanks so much, Beck. And I neglected to say that Beck and Daniel, I think, were, were some of us are going to lunch afterwards. Everyone is invited if you want to continue the conversation. Yes. Um, and Daniel will now continue for an equally minimal three point minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, um, I, I, I took some notes uh, when they, they spoke, um, um, uh, but I, I basically think, you know, it, she, her talk was very nuanced and complex and, and um, she, she made a very good argument, so I don't have much to say. So I, I'm going to pick on what she's ended here with. She ended with two things, a suitcase and um, a, broad, a broad, broad coalitions, I guess. So first, I agree. Uh, the suitcase words are tricky, uh, but they are tricky because they are politicized, right? Uh, so I, I think part of the problem is not necessarily that to be a greenie, it's the association that comes with these greenies. And these associations are not just there, they are created. So I do think, while well, on one hand, these suitcase words, uh, 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 words uh, should be avoided, because they're quite easily incorporated. So something like sustainability, I teach corporate sustainability, it's really easy to incorporate, right? So because it can mean anything. And for corporations that take sustainability, a a relatively radical idea in terms of making sure that the future is also okay, and to turn it into sustainability for the company. That is, we're going to make money for a long time. (laughs) So... They take these. So I agree. Some of these capitalism, I guess, is harder to 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 to, to capture because it goes to the, the the political right. So it's similar with climate change. I do see a lot. Of, climate change is another another on these suitcase words that's so easy. And we know, uh, for example, most of the fossil fuel corporations in Australia they're talking about climate change and being carbon neutral, right? Uh, because they. And, and as a fossil fuel industry talking about climate change and carbon neutrality, it's a bit weird. So I do think you're right in finding, and I absolutely agree in finding these uh, pivots like unfairness. And what we don't often dare to do, what I do think is necessary, is to find another. So this sounds terrible, but I do think pol- politics need the other. It needs the fossil fuel to be uh, an other. Otherwise, we have nothing to have a coalition against. And to build a polit- political coalition, you don't necess- you can never get everyone here in the room to agree on our differences unless we can agree that we are opposing something. So opposing a political idea is, is much harder to agree upon than it is an enemy. And with this, I'm not obviously meaning any 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 any, any violence in any form, uh, but we. I also do think we have to be careful that we're not actually pointing out that fossil fuel industries have to stop. So they need to be as an industry as a, 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 a an, an a, agonistic relation at least, because otherwise we're going to see solutions that are going to benefit them, like. Carbon capture and storage. This idea of carbon capture and storage is going to delay any progressive things for the last 10 years. We're going to see hydrogen. And we're going to see all these words that just means delaying uh, what we need to do, and that is keep fossil fuel in the ground. So I agree. uh, We need those pivot words that are easier, like unfairness, but I don't think that is enough. And finally, on the broad coalition. So I, I guess that's what I said was for that coalition to hold together with our different differences and our p- different political demands, we need an, an other for holding that together. Sorry. Thanks. So I'm going to um, uh, now chair the panel along with my colleague, Chris, who is looking very calm back there. Um but that's that's totally appropriate, Chris. Don't worry. Um, for a few minutes, so that would be about um, about twenty minutes actually, which is excellent. I want to highlight that as 
my expertise as a scholar of social movements says first we have to identify there's a problem and then we have to debate solutions. So I think we're at that point, right? I think that our colleagues have highlighted the problem that we're facing as a community, which is that these corporate activists are out there, they're understudied, they're underknown, and they're influencing our democracy nefariously and delaying our action. Then there's two solutions. One is engaging communities, and the other is just um, trying to drive those corporations into the minority where they can be um, shut down. I guess um, I'm not going to comment on the solution, and I hope that our discussion doesn't get too bogged down on what is more than a 20-minute conversation. Um, but I'll, I want to open the floor to questions, and we do have a tradition of um, inviting a student to ask the first question. And sometimes that can lead to an awkward pause. And sometimes, aha, well done, Michael. Go ahead. Um, so I find this notion of the other really interesting. And Beck, you spoke to some of the complexity that exists in the history of these towns. Like there's a lot of you know, one-way loyalty and outright betrayal that has gone on in their, in their history from these industries, yet there's still this perception that they are dependent. Um, and I guess at the same time, we've got governments rushing now to you know, you know, guide this process that we do need to get through and you know, trying to keep up with social licence with all the you know, things that have to happen. So is there room and how can governments seek to marshal this idea of an other? Because it needs to be local, right? It needs to be gra grassroots, um, you know, building organisation at that local. Oh, good, good point, Daniel. I'll just repeat your question, Michael, for the benefit of the Zoomers. Um, how can governments use this other in the context of communities' loyalties which are sometimes, as Michael also was saying, abused by the corporations that the community experiences. And I guess I'll ask you both to comment. And it seems like we might have a mic. Well done, Chris. Thank you. Did you still have something to add to that, Michael? Oh, yeah, basically. So is, is it possible for a federal government or a state government to actually manage that sort of thing from, the, from a distance? How do you bridge that gap? I personally don't think governments would do that. I think their interests are way too vested in industry and, and that maybe that comes from civil society, grassroots organising. I know, what do you reckon, Dave? No, I, I would agree on that. Um, but it's also this, I don't think, I don't believe in a, in a false consciousness or the uh, docs are here that the, the co-workers don't see through this, right? So uh, when in, in, in at Newcastle, I, I taught MBA with coal managers in my classroom and they obviously see through this. So, it, but it's also very, we also need to then give communities alternative identities. Uh, so this polarization is really feeding into a, a, a status quo um, where if you talk, talk to to the coal miners themselves, they, I mean, they are concerned about the, the, the future generations. They are concerned about a range of things. But at the moment, they're, it's, they're quite easy to capture them in the mining narrative in that sense. Uh, so I don't think there, there's any doxa here that they can't see through. It's just making sure that alternative narrative suspects would perhaps argue, suggest, is, 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 is capturing them in, in, a, in a form of coalition building. Great question. Um, well, thank you. I have two questions. Um, no, one, do one. Oh, just one? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess my question would be to um, Daniel. Uh, how do you define democracy? Because there are different definitions of that. And uh, for example, Jean Dewey would say that democracy is, your, is associated with uh, the full expression of yourself as allowing the full expression of yourself. So how do you define democracy? Yeah, no, it's, it's um, so in, in this talk, I'm not really talking about democracy as a state or a being or uh, an ideal type. I'm more, more talking about democratic processes. Uh, and then I guess the main part there would be the processes for inclusion. Uh, for equality and for, for, for liberty in that sense. Mostly in inclusion, that we're expanding a democracy. Uh, politically, you, you, then, as I mentioned, uh, democracy is empty in that sense. So I, I think it's dangerous to talk about that is a democracy, that is not a democracy, and I don't think that's particularly helpful. So process of democratization, I think, is, is, is better to, to unpack the processes of also uh, de-democratization, which I spoke about in terms of how the process becomes less democratic. 
there anyone on Zoom with questions? And we can assume they're all playing video games, right? <laughs> <laughs> I um I have a question. Oh, did someone just pop in? Um, I have a question um, directed at both of you, really. Um, if we imagine that corporations are groups of people, uh, there we go. Thank you, um, Chris, for the reminder to speak to the mic. If we imagine that corporations are groups of people that have collective identities and are working to influence the system, how can we um, articulate the, the moral boundary um, that makes their work illegitimate and those of activists um, that we might embrace um, uh, more democratically, more consistent with democracy? For me, part of the um, answer to that question is whether they're transparent and whether they faithfully uh, uh, represent themselves as actors as opposed to deceptively conceal their identity. What Have you thought about this? What are your thoughts? Beck, you've got the mic. Yeah. Thanks, Winifred. Um, the thing that immediately comes to my mind, which I was thinking about when you were talking about Pine and the um, spaces in the lobbying sector now is how the words that we use permit certain things and make them morally permissible, like lobbying. And it's quite interesting to me that in Australia, the transparency that we have on corporate lobbying of government is much worse than in the US. Mm -hmm. So there's been some good work by Robert Brule that some of you might know. Um, and he produced a paper a couple of years ago that was looking at the ratio of lobbying expenditure between the electricity utilities and the fossil fuel sector versus the renewables type sector. And he calculated something like a 10 to one average um, countervailing power ratio there. And we can't get that level of information in Australia. So we've got the lobbyist register, but this only is used to track third party lobbyists. So lobbying firms that go in like pines on the lobbyist register, but Lobbying also happens by government relations people who are employed directly by companies. And then the companies fund things like the Minerals Council that have their own in-house lobbyists. And then they um, contract external lobbyists as well. So we have no way to know the actual extent of their lobbying influence. But you'd be well across that um, Grattan Institute report from 2018. And I think one of the things that was emphasised there was how the lobbying is only like this one small part of these networks of influence that come through the patronage and the relationships. Um, and there's a good paper by Adam Lucas in 2021, you know the one? Yeah. Looking at the relationships between the energy sector and people in um, like the politicians and their staffers and just showing this incredible incestuous web of relationships. And that kind of goes back to the way that the Grattan Institute talks about influence and this um, cut across lots of the other sectors that Daniel was talking about, like um, gambling and whatever else, where for this ministerial staffers, it's the revolving door type model where they go in and out and they bring that knowledge and those relationships. But for the politicians, they describe it as a golden escalator. They do their time in government, lay the foundations and move into a well-paid position in the um, sector. Lobbying, or we could equally call it influence or bribery if we decided to draw different moral boundaries around it. So I think I actually didn't really speak to what you said, just picked up a couple of key words from your question. But you were saying something about how if there's like an economic profit motive for the politician, then that makes it kind of more problematic. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Maybe I'll give this to you then. Well, I'm not sure I have a, a much, much to add. I, th I do think, however, it's slightly... Uh, dangerous to give corporations collective identities uh, because for-profit corporations, um, I'm not sure that they can represent a collective identity in their current setups uh, with workers and, and owners, and they are in no means democratically driven. So I do think Making, a, I think that there's a false equivalence between corporations and protest organizations. So a lot of the new protest organizations we're seeing are dream, democratically driven. They are interest driven. Corporations has no interest beyond profit in that sense. Uh, you know, we can have PR firms pretending that they are interested in things, but we also know when there's you know, when there's a choice between profit and or and climate change or profit and human rights, they always choose profit because they have no other interest and they set up for this particular purpose. So we should not be surprised where, where an organization we 
developed and put into law and supported to only have a very narrow interest to make money, then they making money. I mean, this is not surprising, but we should, I think, should be careful to assume that they can do anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, question over here. Please. Just before you take your second question, is there anyone who wanted to raise something else? Um, who has it? Also on Zoom. All right, we're moving back to the favored few. Go ahead, Michael. Apologies. Um, I guess it brings to mind the question to me if are we looking to replace a different set of actors with the same sort of state state capture in this renewables transition? Are we just really waiting for enough money to come in behind renewables to boot the old mob out? And that's a bit depressing. If it's a yes or no question, I'd say yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, I do, I do think we need to think seriously about the alternatives to this kind of influence. So um, the problem is 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 that our democracy is is, is being corrupted, uh, not necessarily a particular industry. Obviously, in climate change, there's, we can see certain industries, but we can easily replace that industry with gambling, tobacco, big soda. And the problem is not the particular industries, it's the impact they have on our democracies. Because we also know, relatively certain by public opinions, a lot of people would be preferring a, a tax on sugary drinks, to deal with this, but this is not possible for governments to deal, deal with a lot of ideas that the public actually would like to have implemented because as we just saw, it took them $22 million to earn a hundred billion, right? So it's not that hard at the moment for big corporations to, to influence government and also put making sure that we stay status quo. I guess on the renewables thing, <clears throat> part of what I observe is that there's been such an entrenched opposition to renewables, that there's such a strong push behind renewables, which is leading to maybe at times not the same level of critical questioning of the way that the industry is operating. And I see that as a big risk. And I think as we're expanding out into regional Australia, and it's not just the turbines and the panels, but the transmission lines, and that's a bit that keeps me awake at night now, the transmission lines, there's just such a risk that there will be the same sorts of minds that have been very good at being critical of the industries that have been the bad guys for a long time might not apply that same questioning to this industry because it seemed to be on the right side. And the idea that we could just switch to a green economy with the same levels of exploitation and capture and control is pretty distressing. Yeah. Wow, green state capture. I had no idea that was a thing. Um, Next, my volunteer is going to ask a question now. I mean, that's what the Conservatives argued the teal thing was, was green state capture, right? Like a billionaire kind of buying votes. But but just in terms of the ironies of democracy, I mean, you were talking about corrupting democracy, but I feel as though, this is just a comment, but I feel as though um, democracy in Australia does a bit of self-harm as well. So, like, of the last six changes in Prime Minister, four of them weren't through a popular vote, they were through party votes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we had that dream situation where we had a very green, conservative Prime Minister mm -hmm. who was popularly um, supported, um, who felt as though they couldn't engage in action on climate change for fear of losing the, the party vote which ultimately happened. So that's a clear case. I mean, the Labor Party changed rules um, to make that harder to happen, but that's a classic case of democracy doing self-harm. And the other one is, I think, around the, you talked about the golden escalator or the revolving door, but in some countries they don't have that. Mm -hmm. And in the famously non-democratic country of China, that is illegal. You can't, if you've served on a government board, you can't serve in a company board and vice versa. It can be done. Uh, it just requires political will. But I think sometimes we're quite complacent about um, our own democracies. Mm -hmm. Great comments. Comment? Oh, I, I agree. I have nothing to add. I think it's just yes. <laughs> ben, were you going to say something? No, I disagree with you. All right, I think um, I'm not seeing a vibe of hands in the room. Oh, oh go oh, ahead, oh, Sarah. Oh, Fantastic. <laughs> Last question from our colleagues. I can't miss this opportunity. I um, mean, it's building a bit on your question, Winifred, about um, I guess how can we encourage the more legitimate forms of public influence and perhaps contain the more distorting 
um, forms of public influence. And I just wondered, I mean, we've talked a little bit about transparency around donations, about needing to be aware of how intermeshed some of these lobbying and patronage networks are. But I just wondered if you could comment a little bit about the mechanisms that corporations use to influence public opinion. So you've both spoken about the media. Beck, I think you mentioned leafletting. You've mentioned um, astroturfing. If there's any kind of mechanisms at that kind of more community level or what what's in the toolkit of corporations when it comes comes to shaping public opinion and, you know, what sort of mechanisms could encourage more transparency or more balance at that level? Great. Going to start, Daniel? Uh. <laughs> Daniel's pulled out a 50-page brochure, yeah. which he's planning to read now. Yeah, yeah starting from the top. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I did put on a slide to mention a few, a few things. Uh, for example, how uh, corporations trying to influence the employees. Um, I, I think part of the, and, and I mentioned the example of, of education and both at university and at primary schools for education materials. We see community involvement. I mean, in any of these cold countries, you would have these big corporations funding uh, sports, community involvement, and doing great things for the community uh, in that sense. So, you know, there are sports field named after every fossil fuel corporations in, in, in Australia. And, and this is great for the community. So I, I think there's it's a lot of dependence that need to be broken up for, 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 uh, a pri for private citizens to, to be able to develop their preferences outside uh, sort of a, a corporate world in that sense. Thank you. Um, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> like out in the Hunter, it's unbelievable. I like you know this from Newcastle. You'll see a poster for the farmers markets and they're sponsored by BHP or sponsored by Santos. It's everywhere. And the social license stuff that sees these companies supporting a whole lot of great things like yeah. sports and volunteerism to some extent, that, and there was work done by Kate Wilson, who did a PhD here at the University of Queensland around when I did, and she was looking at the way in gas towns in particular, these social license type contributions often give an excuse for the state to retreat and it becomes a private provision of public goods, which adds to the risk of when industries are in decline because people know, like we got the new science lab at the state school because the mining industry paid for it. What's going to happen when the mining industry is gone? And something in the Hunter that's quite profound is that People see the alternative industry to the mines as being the thoroughbred horse breeding industry because it's the other big industry there. And so because the thoroughbred industry doesn't have, I mean, they're incredibly wealthy, but they don't put the same cash into the community. People are saying the only thing that's going to keep our community sustained is the mining industry. And so when that goes, it's not just the jobs in the sector and the jobs in the value chain, but it's going to be the upkeep of the roads and the new sports fields and the farmer's markets and everything else that you see around the place. So it's just saturated with um, the industry doing stuff and then reminding everyone that they're doing stuff. And there's all those um, sort of non-formalised uh, mechanisms for the provision of the funds as well, where people feel like they can't speak out because they're on the PNC of the school and then maybe the school won't get the funds that they need for the excursion or whatever's coming up. So all of that stuff is so complicated mm -hmm. and very material in terms of disentanglement. Uh, yeah, and we've seen radical organisations that successful beaten a sort of a hedge on, you know, if you want, has been providing these things, right? So they have provided education, they have provided meals, they have provided alternatives. So as communities, I, I guess this is one way to start thinking about that. So, okay, what are the alternative ways we as a community uh, can provide these services uh, that they at the, at the moment are providing? Uh, and unless we can do that, it's, it's going to be very hard to to do anything about this dependence. That's um, really such a powerful uh, point to finish on. I just want to um, um, highlight, you know, when you put that term refutilization on the slide, Daniel, I was kind of puzzled by it. I couldn't understand it, but I'm thinking about what you're saying about how, you know, these new kind of gig economies, it's like a new generation of peasants that we need to imagine um, not just switching from one overlord to another, um, you know, either the mines or thoroughbred horses, but um, having our own 
um, authority, our own agency, coming together as communities to rebuild it. Um, I, I, I wanted to call the session State Capture and Recapture. I'm not sure if we've reached recapture, but that may just mean a need for another PEPS session, right, in a year when we've transformed democracy. So please join me in the meantime in thanking our brilliant speakers, Daniel and Beck. And I'll just highlight that although Chris and I co-chaired this session, you guys know that we did it with Christine's meticulous notes and run sheet and preparation uh, behind the scenes. So although she's on holiday, we do thank you, Christine, when you watch this recording. And thanks to our Zoomers as well um, for coming in from all around the world, and uh, or at least all around Australia. <laughs> and um, we welcome you to the next session, which is actually going to be hosted in ANU in Canberra. Um, and uh, we are um, trying to get this model of interdisciplinary dialogue on important topics that is intentionally bringing together different perspectives um, to be hosted by other unis. So ANU is going to do a PEP seminar in September and Melbourne will do one in November. And I hope that those of you that are based at universities would ponder if you want to do a PEPS in um, 2024. We're doing them monthly, so um, there's plenty to go around throughout the year. And our criteria, our seminar is on political and environmental psychology and social science. So we have a, a broad remit and um, feel free to stretch that remit if you're interested. Please speak to me and Chris about that. Um, and those of us that are going to lunch, please just hang out. We'll be leaving in two minutes. Um, thank you. Bye, everyone.